motivation. This one's a bit different than what we typically think about when it comes to motivation. So here we go. Traditional definitions of motivation suck. That's all there is to it. We can just end the lecture there. And just think that's enough, right? <laughs> the point is, is that these traditional definitions of motivation, they, let, me, let me qualify that before I go on. They suck in terms of, like, from a scientific perspective. They may make sense on the surface. And of course they make sense on the surface, otherwise it wouldn't be around. We call that face validity. The problem is they have no experimental validity. They're just completely circular, right? So traditional definitions, focus on these internal drives. You have this internal state and that is what is motivating you to do the particular task. You're, you're low in this one thing, this one, you know, whatever it is. So you want to do it and you have this and you have that and it's this internal thing that's moving you forward, right? And it's like, whoa, okay, how do we observe that? Well, we can't. Um, what we can observe is a few other things, right? Um, again, those are typically circular. And why are they circular? Well, the idea is that, well, why did I do X? Because I was motivated to do so. Well, why were you motivated? How do we know you were motivated to do so? Because I did it. Why does the child learn to, you're gonna hear my cat. <laughs> my cat just decided to climb into a, uh, um, suitcase and he got into a spot that's going to be very hard for him to get out but we're just going to let him hang out there so you might hear some weird noises in the background that's my cat freaking out as he's trying to get out of the suitcase or he's just going to take a nap so <laughs> we'll come back to that topic later um, i guess there's something reinforcing about that anyway um, so again why does the kid learn well because he's motivated to learn well how do you know that he's motivated to learn well because he's actually learning yay nice wonderful circular argument completely useless for science completely useless for a, uh, a further understanding of what motivation really is um, so we need to look at motivation from a more scientific and more empirical perspective and of course behavior analysis has taken a more empirical perspective now it gets kind of odd, <laughs> I'll grant you that. And talking about motivation from this perspective can be a bit challenging, So, but it works, right? And there's a lot of evidence to support that this is a very parsimonious and clean way to present what motivation really is. Um, but I do want you to realize that this doesn't fit very well with our society. It doesn't fit very clearly with the views that we typically have. Um, I'm not talking about scientific views, I'm talking about the views that we have as a culture. Right? Um, and if you start spouting off things about CMEOs and EOs and MOs and all this stuff, people are going to be like, you're just crazy. Right? Um, so this is one of those frustrating things is that our culture has, um, loves these circular arguments because they sound great on the surface. Right? So an internal drive and an internal state which motivates you to do something, that's all well and good. It makes sense on the surface. And you can go back a few hundred years and blame Descartes for this whole thing. Um, but th the reality is that's what's going on. That's what, what sounds good in our culture. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's actually what's happening. Right? Just remember, think about it from this perspective. At one time, the world thought the world was flat. Right? Everybody thought that the earth was flat. That was what was culturally appropriate to say. And saying something else got you in trouble, right? That sort of thing happens when you talk about motivation. Believe it or not, it happens when you talk about a lot of this behavior analysis stuff. People just freak out. Um, and that's okay. You know, it, it's, it's part of changing the way we view the world. And that's not a fast process. Okay. So from this other perspective, um, motivation relates to something in the environment that can be observed and measured. So something that influences you to do something. So we, and you might go, oh, reinforcers, they're what influence me to do something. Yeah, that's part of it, right? And in fact, that's a major part of motivation. Um, but we're gonna talk about things that modify reinforcers, all right? We're gonna talk about these things called motivating operations. And we're gonna break them up into four categories, right? Um, and those four categories are actually, uh, let me back up. And we're gonna break motivating operations into two categories. Those two categories are gonna be broken down into two more categories each. So four categories overall to deal with the motivating operations that have been directly observed. These are not inferred. These are things that have been directly observed. Right? There are two categories right off the bat, establishing operations and abolishing operations. Establishing operations increase the effectiveness of a reinforcer. And more accurately, they increase the value of a reinforcer. So if we're thinking about the three-term contingency, um, you got the SD, the response, and the SR, or the, the consequence, right? 
establishing operations and mo or motivating operations in general modify the consequence. They're not something that act directly on your behavior. They modify the consequence of the behavior. So they change the value of the reinforcer or the punisher. Right? So establishing operations are going to increase the value of the reinforcers. Abolishing operations are going to decrease the value of the reinforcers. And again, they affect consequences, both punishers and reinforcers. Got to holler and fight, fighty, knock it off. Hey, <laughs> he's still playing in the bag. Anyway, there's something motivating about that. <laughs> Probably because he never gets to do it. Um, I'm recording this lecture in a room that the cats typically don't get to play in. So uh, they're going crazy in here and having the time of their life. And that's because appropriately, we have established the, the value of this room to be greater. Why? because they don't get to come in here very often. Um, there's stuff I don't want to mess with in here. They have a tendency to knock the books off the shelf and those types of things. So th there might be all sorts of noises that are going on, but uh, they're in here now and they're playing around. So it, we definitely increase the value of this room. We could decrease the value of this room. So change the, uh, change the motivating operation um, by letting them hang out in here all the time. But there's stuff they can get into that I don't want them getting into. So anyway. Um, that was actually a really good example of this situation. I could just kind of finish the lecture, but we're going to go ahead and move forward. So again, the idea is uh, they affect the consequences. They change the value of that, of that consequence of the reinforcer or the punisher. And I'm going to talk about this in terms of just reinforcers, but it, 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 you can apply this to punishers as well. There's the condoms again, right? Those just tend to pop up everywhere. <laughs> anyway, so changing value. An abolishing operation will decrease the effectiveness of a reinforcer. <laughs> this goes really well with the picture, right? I mean, really, think about it. What's the reinforcer for having sex? The feeling you get, right? Um, that's at least part of the reinforcer. Well, guess what a condom does? Decreases that value. It decreases the feeling, right? It makes things less sensitive. So <laughs> when you're using condoms, you're decreasing the value of the sexual behavior, of the, of the reinforcer that's available for sex. And it makes absolute sense why someone would be less likely to choose condoms um, over having sex without a condom um, if they've experienced both, right? Because when you put the condom on, it is going to decrease the value of that sexual act and for both people. Now, there's a way around this, by the way, and it um, has to do with deprivation of sex. So if you deprive yourself of sex long enough, um, then sex with a condom is much more is much more valuable. So deprivation is one of those things we can use. We'll talk about that more here in a moment. Okay. So again, so the condoms are actually an abolishing operation um, for the value of the sexual behavior. When something increases the effectiveness of a reinforcer, we call that an establishing operation. So again, if I deprive you of sex, or if you deprive yourself of sex, then sex becomes much more valuable. You know, there was an interesting study. It wasn't even a study, what was it? It was, it was like the social change thing that happened in, in, in a couple of places. And the, I think it started out in Italy, and then it got picked up in Kenya. And it was absolutely hilarious, and it worked perfectly. And it was a great example of an establishing operation. And what happened was, is that these ladies all got together and they were like, we've had enough of our husbands being assholes. <laughs> and by assholes, I don't mean they were like beating them or things like that, but they just weren't taking care of things. They, they just weren't being a good husband. So uh, the general idea is that the ladies were like, fine, no more Nikki for you until you start doing the things you're supposed to do. So what did they do? They made the value, they increased the value of those other things, like completing their chores, right? Because if they were able to complete their chores for a month, then they were able to get and have sex. So um, they uh, they increase the effectiveness of the various reinforcers by um, abolishing or, or by um, withholding it, right? Um, so they deprived their husbands of sex, which then made sex more reinforcing for them. And of course, they put some other tasks on that, use some great behavior modification techniques. I mean, it, it's just hilarious if you start to think about what all the different things that they used in terms of doing that. I mean they were using rules, they were using goals, uh, they were using motivating operations, um, reinforcers effectively, they were changing the environment, they were selecting for new responses, they were they got response generalization going on, they got stimulus, 
it is actually a great little technique. You can look it up and see it on the internet. There's an interesting story about how that all worked out. And there was a, a large number of women that got together and did that. And the basic idea is that they're just trying to change their husband's behavior. Okay. The trick with motivating operations and what makes them motivating is that they happen before the reinforcer is delivered. So you put the condom on, that happens before the reinforcer, right? Um, and that immediately changes the value of that reinforcer. Okay. Uh, so these things, I mean, in that three-term contingency, I don't like to put them in front of the SDs, but some people do. I, I kind of put them off to the side and, and put an arrow directly towards the consequence because that's what they're doing. They're really affecting that. They don't affect the discriminative stimulus. They don't affect your behavior directly. They affect the reinforcer, which then may in turn affect the behavior. And again, it's only changing the value. It doesn't, it doesn't like get rid of it. It's not a consequence in and to itself. It just changes the value of that consequence. Interestingly enough, these do not depend on learning learning history. At least one category of them doesn't. And that category is the, the unconditioned ones, right? So you have unconditioned motivating operations, unconditioned uh, establishing operations, and unconditioned abolishing operations, right? Uh, so those are the ones that don't depend on learning history. And the conditioned motivating operations, they only depend partially on learning history. They depend on the fact that those CMEOs and CMAOs are that, that you've already been conditioned for those reinforcers to work or those punishers to work, but again, it doesn't changing the value of those things um, is not a learned sort of thing. It's just literally through depri deprivation, satiation, and other techniques. Oh, <laughs> right, poor kiddo in tears, right? So deprivation. <laughs> We deprive you of something. Generally, anything that we deprive you of, it increases the value of it. We talked about that before, right? So we talked about um, withholding access to a reinforcer to make that reinforcer more valuable. What we were really talking about was establishing operations. Right? There may be some others out there that you can think of, okay? But deprivation in general is a very effective technique. So you want to make uh, access, you want to make one behavior more reinforcing than. Uh, or more likely to occur than withhold access to it for a while. You know, we talked about this with the premac principle, right? The low probability behavior and high probability behavior stuff. So I can even make low probability behavior reinforcing by preventing you from doing it. And by preventing you from doing it for a while, that basically means that you're not going to get the reinforcers for that. And as a result, it increases the value of it. Abolishing operations, satiation, fill you up, guess what? So if, I, if I've got you completely full on something, um, so if I let you eat all the M&Ms in the world that you want, um, you let me eat all the chips in the world I want, that type of thing, then uh, guess what? Uh, it's going to decrease the value of those reinforcers. And, and in fact, you know, I have this certain group of students that are reinforcing my behavior uh, for showing up for class on time, and what, what they've done is <laughs> use... Uh, Cheetos or various chips in order to reinforce my behavior. Well, in order for that to work, uh, continue to work, one of the things that I actually self-manage here is making sure that I don't buy chips at other times. Right? So you're not going to see chips in my house, you're not going to see chips in my office, unless they're the ones that I'm getting as reinforcers. The idea is, is that I'm not satiating myself on chips, because if I satiated myself on chips, then the ones that are brought to class to reinforce my behavior are uh, the being on time are not going to work. In other words, I will have abolished the effectiveness of it. Right? There may be some others. Your job to think about that. Right? So let's look at the conditioned versus unconditioned stuff. Pretty straightforward. With unconditioned motivating operations, a value effect, value altering effect is in a. If I deprive you of food, you don't have to learn anything about that. That will work right off the bat. Okay. In fact, this is one of those things that we use when we're doing animal research is we um, deprive them of food. We get them to a particular free feeding weight. And once we achieve the, you know, the so they're at their free feeding weight, let's say, I don't know, whatever number of grams that that would be for a squirrel or a chipmunk, whatever that is there, a squirrel. Um, then we then withhold some food for a while. We deprive them of some food until they drop below their free feeding weight. At that point, food is a very, very valuable reinforcer. And we have established the effectiveness of that reinforcer in the end. The animal will work hard for that. So, but the behavior that is affected by this value altering effect is learned. So think of the chipmunk pressing or the, the squirrel pressing the lever or the rat pressing the lever or whatever it is in the opera chamber. That lever is learned, but the value of the, uh, the reinforcer is not. It's something that it's absolutely innate. 
with condition motivating operations, the value effect is due to learning. So um, the example I gave earlier, right, um, about in the previous lecture, about that imagined pressure, right? So the guy doing the golfing thing, so he's adding that imagined pressure to himself. The idea is, is that that is some sort of value altering effect. So if you imagine that yourself's under pressure and you imagine, you know, it's like, it's the 18th hole of the US Open and you're tied and you gotta make this one putt for birdie in order to win, right? You're, what you're trying to do is alter the value of the re of reinforcer. In other words, alter the value of making the putt to make it more likely that you'll do it and make it more valuable when you do. But that's something you had to learn to do, right? Um, that's not an innate sort of thing. Um, one of the other ones that we talk about uh, is money, right? So deprivation and satiation of money is actually a condition motivating operation. It may seem unconditioned, but you had to learn what the, what the value of money was in the first place. How are these things different than SDEs and S deltas? Right? The idea is that a discriminative stimulus is a signal that tells you that a reinforcer is available for a particular behavior. So the SDEs are connected to a response, right? in the sense that that response will be reinforced. That's what an SD is saying. Okay? CMOs are events or conditions that alter the effectiveness of the consequence. So these things are, are targeted at the end. They're not targeted at a response. Right? So they're changing the value of the reinforcer, which then could be used for any response. Okay? So they're not the discriminative stimuli, they're not signaling what to do, they're not signaling any of that stuff. They're just saying that uh, all they're going to do is change the value of the reinforcers. Right? They are very, very temporary. You don't get stimulus control developing with CMOs like you do with a discriminative stimulus. The, you know, once, the, once you've been undeprived, so to speak, once you're back to your free feeding weight, then food is less valuable. This is an interesting one to think about. Oftentimes rules and goals are not really discriminative stimuli. We kind of talk about them as being SDs. They kind of are, they kind of aren't. But some people have argued that rules and goals are actually condition uh, motivating operations. The idea that, especially with goals, the idea with the goal is that by stating that goal, I'm altering the value of doing the behavior that is being set up in that goal. Right? Because then uh, now I have achieved it, and that achievement um, is, is more important than uh, like reaching the goal, right? So I've reached the goal rather than just, oh yeah, I did the behavior. Oh yeah, I was um, successful today at not smoking a cigarette. Yay. Okay? But if you say, hey, I made my first, I achieved my first goal, my first step in getting rid of, uh, in getting rid of smoking cigarettes um, was today, and I did it, right? So it increases that value. You set that goal, and it increased the value of the reinforcement. I do believe that's it. So we'll talk to you soon and I hope you've enjoyed this set of lectures.